Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us right here on The Right View. Tonight, we're joined by former NFL player, U.S. Army Ranger, and now candidate for United States Senate in his home state of Arkansas, Jake Beckett. Jake, welcome to The Right View. Um, there's so much to talk to you about. First of all, I mean, just basically a, a jack of all trades here, a, a renaissance man, if you will. Um, this is, it's sort of amazing to see that you were a, a football player in, in college and pr professionally. Then you went into uh, becoming an army ranger and serving our country. Thank you for that. And now you're running for Senate. I mean, do you sleep? What's going on with you these days? Well, first of all, Laura, it's great to be on with you. Thanks for having me on. Um, and, and yeah, I've had a I guess a bit of a unique background, uh, if you will. Most people in my home state of Arkansas know me for my football career uh, thus far. I come from a bit of a football family. My grandpa, dad, and uncle all played football at the University of Arkansas before me, starting in the 1950s. That's before you wore face masks. Wow. So, um, yeah, we, we've had quite a Razorback legacy, and I was very blessed to continue that legacy on uh, when I played football at the University of Arkansas. But yeah, it, it was the honor of my life to serve our country in uniform. And, and now, you know, I'm running to represent the great state of Arkansas in the U.S. Senate. Uh, it, it's, you know, Arkansas is a great place. It's God country. Uh, you know, I know I'm very biased, but it's a very special place. And uh, it, it's a country, it, it's a state that we're all very proud of. Well, so now your, your dad, your uncle, your grandfather all played football at Arkansas. Okay, now what if you would have gone to like Ole Miss? What would have happened to you and then played for them? I would have been disowned. You know, my <laughs> grandfather, uh, he always told the story, uh, and he and my dad. So my grandpa played with a guy named Billy Ray Smith Sr., who won a Super Bowl championship with the old Baltimore Colts. His son, Billy Ray Jr., and my dad were teammates. And Billy Ray Sr. had this saying, you know, his son, Jr., was a big-time recruit. And he said, son, you know, he pulled up in the, in the driveway of their childhood home with a new pickup truck. He said, son, you can either drive to Arkansas or walk to Texas. And oh, so, wow. you know, that was the, uh, that was kind of the same. I wasn't as highly recruited as Billy Ray Smith Jr. was, but it was kind of the same mentality in my house. Uh, you know, I could, I could drive to Fayetteville or I could walk somewhere else. I didn't have a choice. I hear it. Well, yeah, I grew up um, in a, a very small neighborhood. I went to North Carolina State, but basically in North Carolina, it's, it's like UNC, so Chapel Hill State or Duke that most people, that's kind of like the, the thing. My neighborhood was all filled with NC State people. So if I had chosen poorly, I don't even know if I'd be able to walk back into my neighborhood, like my parents' neighbors. I don't even know what would have happened. So I totally feel you on that. Now, I wasn't playing football, but I'll tell you something. My dad um, was a linebacker at Purdue back in the day, and I fancied myself perhaps one of these women that was going to like somehow play football because I love college football that much. Obviously right. didn't pan out. Maybe it's not too late. We'll see what happens. Um, but for you, I mean, did you know growing up you were like, was college football it? You were going to play football for sure? Well, yes, that was my one dream. I couldn't screw up the family legacy. Uh, but now I, I really made a decision at a young age to, to work hard. And I set that goal of one day earning a scholarship to play football at the University of Arkansas and wear that razor back on my helmet. I was very blessed to be able to achieve that. I was not a big time high school recruit. I was very lucky to get that scholarship offer uh, when the, the then head coach at the time, Houston Nutt, offered me the scholarship. I mean, before he could even get the words out of his mouth, I accepted. I didn't want him to change his mind and rescind the offer. Um, but, you know, it was, a, it was a great opportunity. I was very blessed to be up there and be a part of some great teams. Uh, I was a two-time team captain. Uh, my first couple of years, we were terrible, but we were. It was a time of transition. We had a new coaching staff come in, but my last two years, we were we were excellent. We finished top five in the country my senior year, and it was just it was a lot of fun to be a part of a great college football team. You know, in the SEC, uh, we played some great games, had some great wins, and you know, some tough losses. But that's just part of the deal, and uh, it's just you know, in the SEC, you know, the the old slogan, it just means more. It really does. I mean, people just they live and breathe college football down yeah. here, especially in the state of Arkansas. There's no pro football teams. There's no pro sports teams. So the University of Arkansas, that's it. And to be a part of a great Razorback legacy, you know, it's just a dream come true. So after college, you were drafted in the third round by the New England Patriots. Uh, you were on the team from 2012 to 2015. First of all, how was the change? You, you had lived your whole life 
in Arkansas and then you moved to Boston. What what was that like? Did you like Boston? How was the cold? Tell me what you thought about all that. Well, there was an adjustment, that's for sure. But I really enjoyed my time in Boston. I love history. I love American history. And Boston is a great place yeah. uh, to really dive into some great American history, the Revolutionary War era. Um, you know, it, it's a great place and a great sports town. You know, the, the Patriots, the Red Sox, the Celtics, the Bruins. I'd never been to a pro hockey game until I saw the Boston Bruins play, uh, you know, in the in the NHL playoffs. That was an amazing experience. Uh, so really, I really enjoyed my time in Boston. You know, the cold, I mean, you know, the blizzards and all that stuff. Uh, that was a Brutal. big adjustment. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, other than, you know, uh, buying some new winter clothing, uh, it was a great experience. And I was just very blessed to be a part of an amazing dynasty and just being around some of the all-time greats, Bill Belichick, Tom Brady. I mean, I learned a lot that I carried with me. Yeah, and I will carry with me for the rest of my life. Yeah, I mean, for sure. That it sounds amazing. I, I'll tell you, you're right about getting like a whole new wardrobe. Um, just a small side note here. When I moved to New York, the only coat I had, because I, I grew up on the coast in North Carolina. And yeah, we have a seasonal change there, but it is nothing like the Northeast. I had like a pea coat and that basically got me through winters in North Carolina, no problem. I moved to New York and I will never forget the first time we had a really cold day, and it was honestly, it was probably like in in the like high 40s. And I was like, this is not going to work out. Nobody tells you, not only do you have to buy a coat, you got to have like snow boots because the second you step in like some nasty puddle that is like half frozen, it's disgusting. No one tells you these things, Jake. And then you get to New York, you get to Boston. It's a whole new wardrobe situation. I wasn't as fortunate enough to be uh, as you were to be playing for a professional football team when I moved to New York. But still, um, I, I want to talk, though, about what you did um, after 2015 because you retired from professional football and you did something that, I mean, I think it, most people find hard to believe. Um, I, I am sure it is extremely rare. You enlisted in the United States Army. I mean, you, you know, people know you're a professional football player. You, you're obviously successful. You made at least some money doing that. What possessed you to want to enlist in the Army after you'd had all this other success? My entire life, I'd always felt that I, I wanted to serve my country in some capacity. I, I wanted to serve in the military in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Uh, I wanted to play football for as long as I could, and I did, but... You know, when I got to the NFL, you know, I was still relatively young and healthy um, and I wanted to serve. Um, you know, it really started. I started to feel the call my last couple of years in New England. Uh, it, it's not well known. I don't think that, you know, Coach Belichick, he's a strong supporter of the military. He grew up. His dad, Steve Belichick, was a longtime coach at the Naval Academy at Annapolis. And so he grew up in a very pro military uh, environment. And so Coach Belichick would have a lot of veterans a lot of former admirals and generals and uh, people like that come and speak to the team. Uh, and one person in particular was a former Navy SEAL, you know, someone who I you know, really looked up to. And you know, when I would hear him speak about his service uh, as a SEAL, that really you know, sealed it for me, so to speak, that I was going to serve in the military when my football career was over. And I enlisted in the Army and commissioned as an infantry officer, um, you know, shortly thereafter. And, and that was just it was it was something that you know, it was a risk. You know, you're exactly right. It's it's. I guess kind of a non-traditional career path, but it was something I felt called to do, and you know I've been inspired by many other Americans throughout history who you know have may have had other opportunities, but they felt compelled to serve, and you know I wanted to serve my country. Wow, I mean honestly, your story very much reminds me, and I'm sure you hear this all the time of Pat Tillman, and for for so many people, you know Pat Tillman. Uh, he became an Army Ranger, which I want to talk to you about it more because you went to Ranger school. I mean, like one of the hardest things that you can possibly choose to do. Um, obviously, he was he was killed. He enlisted after 9-11 um, and was was killed over in, I believe, Afghanistan, but left a professional football career to to serve our country. I want to say thank you to you. Uh, for choosing to do that. It is an incredibly selfless act, and we are so fortunate to have people like you that say, you know what, I, I know that I'm taking a risk here, but I love this country enough that I, I want to give back and I want to do this. Um, do you hear that a lot? Do people say that you, like your story reminds me of them of Pat Tillman? 
Well, well thank you very much. Uh, and it, it truly was an honor to serve. But, you know, my, my service, first and foremost, is nothing compared to Pat Tillman's. He made the ultimate sacrifice. He laid down his life in defense of our country. But, you know, he, he definitely was an inspiration. You know, he was someone who walked away from an NFL career uh, and, and decided to wear the uniform. And there have been many stories, uh, you know, throughout uh, our country's history of, of sports stars. Uh, you know, Rocky Blyer, Alejandro Villanueva, Pat Tillman, and, uh, Ted Williams from Boston. You know, he was a, uh, you know, an ace pilot uh, in the Korean War in World War II. Um, so there's a there's a long tradition in this country of people in the in the world of sports uh, who also had the legacy of service as a part of their story. And I wanted to be a part of that. And I, I want to look back at my life and, you know, know that I had the opportunity to serve and I didn't. Uh, and, and truly, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Wow. And, and tell me about becoming a, an Army Ranger, because, I mean, that is, it's a it's an incredibly hard thing to do. I, was Do you feel like having um, trained the way you did for, for football, for sports your whole life, did it give you an advantage, or, I mean, could nothing really prepare you for that? No, it definitely did. A, a sports background definitely was a good preparation uh, for Ranger School and for the infantry. You know, I like to joke that, you know, after you've done training camp with Bobby Petrino and Bill Belichick, then you're ready for anything. But Ranger School is a whole different animal. I mean, it's a it's a 62 day at the at the minimum uh, gut check. It's a physical challenge. It's a mental challenge, an emotional challenge, even a spiritual challenge. Uh, it, it was definitely one of the hardest things I've ever done in my entire life. But it was worth it. I mean, beyond all the the training that you receive in small unit tactics, infantry tactics, it's a great leadership school. You know, because yeah. you have to sacrifice. You know that you're, you know, you're purposefully sleep deprived, food deprived. I lost about 45 pounds in two what? months. Oh yeah, my I mean, gosh! At Ranger School, weighing about 195, my parents barely even recognized me when I came out of there, and that's actually pretty wow. typical. Um, but it was worth it. I, I made the the commitment that, you know, when I went into Ranger School, I just told myself, you know, I'm I'm going to do this. I, I'm I'm going into Ranger School, and I'm not coming out um, without my Ranger tab. And, and I, I was blessed to have some some great friends and comrades who are surrounding me and you can't do it alone. And that's the other thing about Ranger School that, you know, that it, it becomes so apparent immediately is that, um, you know, you have to be one of those guys who's always an asset, not a liability. You know, someone who puts out, who helps your fellow Ranger students, even when you're not being evaluated, because when it's your turn, when you're on the hot seat, when you're being evaluated, you know, on your mission where you're in leadership, you know, those guys are going to remember. Hey, did this guy, did he help me out when he That's wasn't right. under the gun? And so I'm going to support him. So you've got to be one of those guys or else you'll never make it. And that's why, you know, getting your Ranger tab is, is such a great accomplishment. And it's something that I'm very blessed to, to say is part of my legacy. I mean, it's so amazing. So cool. Um, I would love to even get a little taste of that training. I'm a bit of a masochist in some ways. <laughs> like the, I, I do kind of crazy I do CrossFit, I do triathlons, marathons, all kinds of stuff like that. And I, I always am like, you know, if they could just let me, I don't even want to say give it a shot because I'm, who knows um, how long I would even last. But I think that would just be so awesome to know that you got through something as challenging as, as Army Ranger School. I mean, kudos to you. Very, very cool. And by the way, I think it speaks very highly of, of your character and people's character who actually make it through something like that because obviously you had an upbringing where your parents said, you know, once you start and commit to something, you don't quit. And that's how I was raised at least. And I, I got to tell you, I feel like so many kids today, um, they're, it's such a disservice to them that we are just letting the, the youth of this country in so many respects just get get everything easily and they don't have to work for things and there are no consequences if you quit everybody jake gets a participation trophy at right. the end of the day nobody has to really work hard for anything but obviously you were raised like i was raised and like so many i feel like of our generation were raised do you ever think about that do you worry about what happens when you have an entire generation of of kids in america who really don't know what hard work is and are just allowed to kind of quit and, and think that things should come easily to them? No, you're exactly right. It's part of the cultural crisis that we're in right now. And, and there, there are so few uh, kids out there, at least relative to generations past, who truly understand what you just described. I mean, just the, 
the, the very ideas that we took for granted that were hammered into us by our parents and grandparents, hard work, blood, sweat, and tears, sacrifice, setting goals, achieving them, you know, you know putting away, you know, doing the, you know, doing the hard right over the easy wrong. Um, you know, those things that we took for granted are not being taught in our culture. And we have to, we have to fight to take that culture back. It's not just going to happen by accident. And, you know, it starts at home. It always starts around the dinner table, as Ronald Reagan said. It starts with two parent homes with a mother and a father who believe in those things, who want to instill those things in their children. And, and it has to start out from there. But it takes a movement. And, you know, it's not just a cultural thing. It's not just a political thing. They work hand in hand. And, and that's yeah. part of the reason why I've decided to run for office is because, you know, we need bold, dynamic leaders you know, in our on the national stage who aren't afraid to talk about these things, you know, who aren't afraid yeah. to talk about the cultural rot that's happening, you know, at every level of our political institutions and our cultural institutions and even inside some of our families. I'm not going to stand for it because, you know, if we can't, if this generation, you know, if the younger generation can't turn it around, then we are truly lost. Yeah, I mean, it's a really scary trajectory if we can't turn that around. I, I also, not to get too sidetracked on this, but I, I will never forget, I think I was in seventh grade and I was on a basketball team. And for whatever reason, I was just so, sort of like done with the basketball team. We were having too many practices or something. And I remember my dad saying, you wanted to be on this team. You committed to be on this team and you will finish the entire season on this team. And I mean, I was so mad about that. But in my opinion, you know what? If your kids aren't kind of like upset with you about the things that you make them do from the age of say like 12 to 18, you probably aren't doing something right. Like you're probably not being a great parent. They're not supposed to be your friend. You're supposed to guide them and teach them valuable lessons. So thank you, dad, for making me stay on the basketball team. I don't even remember how we finished that year, but. No, but you, you learn you learn the important lesson. And yeah. when, when I made the commitment to, you know, treat my development in sports, my development as an athlete, as a, as a job, as a profession, when I was still a teenager, you know, my, my dad would work with me, trainers would work with me. And like, I remember distinctly, you know, other parents and other adults would come up to my dad and my family members and my coaches and like almost kind of get upset with them for pushing me so hard. And, 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 you know, I looked at that almost as a badge of honor. Like, I, yeah. I know that I'm outworking everyone. I'm doing what no one else around me is willing to do. And I know for a fact that's one of the reasons why I was able to have success in sports and then the military. Amen to that. So I have to ask you, though. So you, you did all this other stuff, and now you're running for Senate in Arkansas. Um Look, our family has been through a lot <laughs> politically. We got a, a very quick lesson in um, the swamp and just how awful these people can be to you when they disagree with you know what you represent, when they disagree with your outlook for America and generally what you stand for. And by the way, that means standing against the swamp in DC. So I can tell you that, that you're in for it. And I mean, I'm sure you know that you're a smart guy. So what made you want to say, you know what? I know there are a million other things that I could possibly be doing, but let me try. Let me run for Senate in my home state. Why did you want to do it? Well, first, let me say thank you to you and your family. You know, President Trump and the entire Trump family has galvanized conservatives and America first patriots all over this country because you were outsiders. You did not come from the establishment political That's class. Right. You came from real America and you spoke the truth courageously and without reservation. And we need more leaders like that who understand what our founding fathers did was that political leadership is supposed to be sacrificial. OK, those founders, when they signed that Declaration of Independence, they pledged their lives, their fortunes and their sacred honor to sacrifice for this country. And unfortunately, all these years later, it's completely inverted. Too many politicians in both parties, they look at politics as a profession, as a way to enhance their own fame, enhance their own wealth. We need more sacrificial leaders, leaders who understand you know, what it means to actually um, you know, stand up for something because you're gonna get attacked instantly. Um, but, but I think it, I have a lot of hope because I see a new generation of conservative patriots rising up um, you know, people around the country, you know, not just in Arkansas, but around this nation um, who understand what it means, you know, wh what it's going to take to take our country back. And it's going to be yeah. standing up. It's going to mean leading from the front, as we say in the infantry. It it's going to be, you know, doing what it takes to be a difference maker, to move the needle on key issues. 
you know, understanding. I, I think part of the problem is too many establishment Republicans, frankly, you know, they, they they cringe at the very thought of criticism, right? They don't understand the nature of the fight that we're in. And just being in this fight, it's a war. You're going to take flack, okay? You're going to yeah. take all kinds of heat from the media, from the radical left. Quite just frankly, have- Jake, if you're not, then you're probably doing something wrong. I mean, that's how you know you're doing it right is when they're they're attacking you because you're a threat to them. If you're an invisible, you know, establishment Republican, that means you're not doing your job because you're not under constant attack because exactly as you said, the radical left doesn't see you as a threat. And I I think you're seeing the the tide start to turn. You know, there's more people who are running for office with the right intentions, people who are willing to sacrifice. Look, I just anecdotally, you know, a lot of members of the military who I serve with who've just gotten out, they're, they're looking to me, they're saying, hey, Jake, I love what you're doing. I want to run for office wow. because there's patriots all over this country who, who understand what it takes to turn this country around. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be overnight, but there's going to be a groundswell. And with God's help, I'll, I'll help lead it. Wow. I certainly, I, I love to hear that. And I love your optimism. Um, I think Americans are generally optimistic. I think we, we always have been. It's one of the reasons that we've persevered in our country has remained as great as it is, is because we are always optimistic. We always know that we have great leaders on the horizon. We have great things to come in this country. And and I think you're right. I, I do feel the tide turning. Gosh, especially for anybody that legitimately voted for Joe Biden to see the disaster, the mess that has happened over the past several weeks in Afghanistan, um, to see the way that he has been a total failure on pretty much every front uh, as president of the United States. Um, and then you don't hear anything from the other side. You you barely hear any pushback from the media. All of these people that were out campaigning for Joe Biden have nothing to say about it. And I think people are starting to wake up across America and say, wait a minute, this is really bad and we are only eight months in. So something has to change. We cannot have this sort of uh, long-term plan for America where we look weak on the world stage, where we let terrorist organizations take over entire countries, where we have just a fully open southern border. We are threatened from all ways now. I mean, I can't, gosh, if you were a terrorist, wouldn't you just come on over the southern border? It's wide open. Um, It's just, there's so many things that I think people quickly, you go to the gas pump. I went and put half a tank of gas in my car today, it cost me almost $60, okay? And when my father-in-law left office, it was about half that. So I, I think people are every single day feeling the impact of the woke left, of all their virtue signaling, all their nonsense. It's all garbage and it doesn't do anything positive for America. And I think the tide is turning and I do agree with you. There are people that are ready to step up just like you and say, you know what? I'm doing this for the right reasons. I really want the future of America to be bright. I'm not just doing this for myself. And I also want to give you a quick shout out because after you served in Iraq, as though it wasn't enough, you returned home to Arkansas and you launched uh, the Arkansas Fund. It's a nonprofit dedicated to helping small businesses in Arkansas that have struggled as so many have because of COVID-19, so far you've raised over $100,000 and distributed 35 grants to aid small businesses statewide. Jake, I mean, this is awesome. Um, Why did you decide to do that? Because I mean, so many people I feel like have been struggling, but they're like, well, I'm gonna worry about myself. Well, first of all, thank you. Yeah, one of the first things I did when I returned home to Arkansas um, after I left active duty service in the Army was launch the Arkansas Fund, which is a nonprofit small business relief fund that specifically helped Arkansas small businesses. I'm sure you heard of and were following the Barstool Fund that was started by Dave Portnoy, who's yeah. a Boston guy. Um, and one of the small businesses he helped uh, was an Arkansas small business not far from my childhood home. Uh, right here in Little Rock, Arkansas. And so I I figured, hey, if Dave Portnoy can help an Arkansas small business that's hurting, you know, why not me? And so I I started this nonprofit and, you know, I started traveling around the state, raised a lot of money, got into the hands of the small business owners and their employees who needed it. And and I was hearing this was, you know, this was earlier in the year um, and, and they were all saying, you know, look, we're already feeling the effects of the Biden administration. Look, they they were seeing skyrocketing inflation. They were seeing, um, you know, disruptions to their supply chains. 
Uh, they were seeing components that weren't coming in from overseas or being manufactured here domestically. They couldn't hire anyone, um, you know, because the Biden uh, unemployment benefits were, you know, they, they couldn't compete uh, with the federal government for workers. And, and it was just an absolute disaster. And they told me, look, they what they feared most of all was another suppression of the economy, another shutdown. And, you know, Joe Biden, his administration uh, ha has, you know, threatened that. Uh, numerous times over the month that they're terrified, these small business owners and their employees, that they'll be told they're not essential, that they're, they'll have their livelihoods once again snatched from them. And it's absolutely ridiculous. And I think all of that goes to, to, to say, and just commenting on what you said earlier, is that leadership matters. And, and we're, we're seeing the catastrophic consequences of Joe Biden's failed leadership, not only in Afghanistan, not only on the international stage, but right here in the United States. And Joe Biden cannot run from the American people. Now, I'm sure you've seen his in the latest polling. I mean, his his opinion polls are in the tank right where they belong because people are. I mean, the scales are being lifted from their eyes every single day. They see someone who's weak and incompetent. You know, he he spends most of his time on vacation or in his basement. Yeah. He can't even answer a few candid questions. Uh, you know, from the press, it's just an absolute disgrace. It's dangerous. Um, you know, it, it's I, I shudder to think it several more years of this kind of incompetence from the commander in chief. Um, and it's just an absolute disgrace. And when I served in the army, I can tell you firsthand, like as an active duty infantry officer, you know, I had a commander in chief who presented strength, both domestically and internationally. We knew that he had our backs. We knew that President Trump, you know, when the going got tough, that our enemies were going to fear us. And right now it's totally opposite. Joe Biden, our enemies are laughing at us. You know, China is looking at Taiwan. The Russians are looking towards Eastern Europe. The Iranians and North Koreans are already making more aggressive moves to expand their nuclear weapons programs. Look, this is a dangerous time in foreign policy. It's a tragic time domestically, and we've got to have better leadership in the House and the Senate and then take back the White House in 2024. Gosh, I hope so. I mean, God, we're, we're not even a year in to Joe Biden, and, and it is it is so bad. I mean, I had such low expectations. He has surpassed even the lowest expectation that I had for what was possible under a Biden presidency. I mean, it's been horrific. I, I just don't know. If we if we have three more years of this to go, I, I don't even know if Americans can survive. The only thing I wanna tell everybody is 2022 is so vital to the future of America. We have to take back the House and Senate, as you just said. Uh, the Democrats are ready to take power any way they possibly can. We know that there is nothing that they won't do to, to take power for themselves, to remain in power in perpetuity. We know that they've tried to pass uh, numerous times bills that would basically ensure that they win every election going forward. And thank goodness um, those did not go through but but they're they're ready to do it. They're ready. Um, they're ready on all fronts to basically ruin America. So 22, we've got to pay very close attention to. Everyone has to get out and vote for conservatives because it is the only way we can make it through this. I mean, if you know, with Joe Biden at the helm, my goodness, it's really scary. Um, I want to ask you quickly because we are now approaching in a couple of days the 20th anniversary of September 11th and and you know everybody that I feel like is is of our age and older remembers that day remembers where they were remembers what was happening um do you have any thoughts as we as we approach September 11th um this Saturday because for me I, I always think back to uh, look I feel like we're incredibly divided right now as a country at least in my lifetime I don't feel like we've ever been as divided as we are right now. But I remember the feeling in the months just after 9-11, and I talk about this all the time because I really believe we can get back to this, this place, this feeling in America. We were so united as a country right after 9-11. I feel like people, it didn't matter what your political leanings, it didn't matter anything else. All that mattered is that we were all Americans, we were in this together. And, and it just felt like such great camaraderie in America. Um, do you have any thoughts uh, around September 11th or anything you want to talk about? Because I feel like it is still something for, for those of us that lived through that, that we are still all processing. And I can't believe it's been 20 years. 
A absolutely. It it's such an important anniversary. And looking back, look, I remember 9-11 like it was yesterday. That that day made such an impression on, on me and it did on, on every American. And, and you know, I I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a part of you know, one of the reasons why I decided to join the military is because, you know, I was that was a, a very formative time for me and for so many you know, young Americans who, who saw, you know, the planes go into those towers and it, it changed the world and it, yeah. it really changed the nature of, you know, the battles that we fight um, both domestically and internationally. Um, you know, it opened the eyes to the dangers of radical Islamic terrorism, um, you know, but also it, it really, um, you know, it, it, it united us. I, I think you're exactly right. Yeah. You know, that was, that was, it, it may have been the last time this country has been truly united. Um, you know, and we've, I, I love the anniversaries because typically it's, it's a time where this country is able to put aside our differences. Um, you know, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, I was playing football at the University of Arkansas. It was one of my favorite memories because the entire stadium was striped out in red, white, and blue. There was a flyover. Um, you know, it was just a great, it was a great moment. And I, I anticipate there will be other great moments in college football stadiums nationwide this Saturday because the anniversary does fall on Saturday. I'll be yeah. in Fayetteville, Arkansas at the, at the Arkansas Texas football game. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a watershed moment for for millions of Americans. Um, you know, I, I think about it nearly every day, and you know, it's just it, it inspired a generation of young Americans to to serve in the military, to serve our country, um, and we can never forget the sacrifices made, um, you know, by those civilians and the sacrifices made uh, by those in our armed forces fighting terrorism uh, internationally in the years since 9/11. Yeah. Uh, and you know what, e even down to the way that we respected police officers, I remember the years following 9-11, how it was NYPD strong. Everybody was wanted to back, you know, the police and thank you to your first responders. And, and now to see the war on cops and how disgusting the behavior from the left has been um, to to these men and women who who leave their house every day, they don't know if they're going to come back. They their job is to protect our communities, and we're so grateful for them. Um, it, it's just it's all of it. I, I I just I want us to get back to the feeling that we had, and I really think we can. I, I know that it feels impossible right now, but um, but if there's one thing we can unite behind, it's how bad a job Joe Biden is doing. I don't care if you voted for him or not. You cannot tell me you think. He's doing a great job. Um, Jake, I want to ask you, where can people find out more about the campaign? Um, where can they learn more about you? Yeah, go to my website, jakebeckett.com. Uh, it's J-A-K-E-B-E-Q-U-E-T-T-E. -E -E. We've had tons of support, both inside of the state of Arkansas and nationwide. People are ready for young, bold, dynamic conservatives uh, to take back uh, the United States Senate in 2022. Uh, I'm here to represent the great state of Arkansas in the Senate. And how do we feel about Arkansas's chances on Saturday? They're going to win? Oh, hogs by 100, guaranteed. <laughs> Take it to the bank. Oh, I love it. Jake Beckett, thank you so much for uh, for spending some time with us at, right here at The Right View. Uh, we're going to follow your campaign. We hope you'll come back soon. Um, good luck with everything. And to everybody at home, as always, we'll see you back here next time for more of The Right View. Thanks, Laura. God bless.